I am a professor of Cuban and Caribbean history here at the University of Florida, and I am a Cuban born in the United States who grew up in Kansas and Miami. First, I think, you know, to be in, uninterested in the Cuban Revolution as a person of Cuban descent with lots of Cuban family would be virtually impossible. There is no escape from the Cuban Revolution. Traditional approaches to the Cuban Revolution have two characteristics. The first is that they are very top-down, so the only protagonists are Fidel Castro, five guys, a couple of women in the United States. And the second um, characteristic is that they tend to take uh, the, the support of the Cuban people. Um, once um, that small group, or it depends on how you count it, um, the people of very, very disaffected middle-class folks and upper-class folks leave. And they take very much um, popular support for granted. And I I'm very interested in turning those things on, or those arguments or those views on their heads. First, um, I take a very bottom-up approach. I'm very interested in the experience of citizens of all sectors, and that includes the middle class, but it also includes peasants, it includes blacks, it includes former slum dwellers, homosexuals, women intellectuals, and young communists. Um, and secondly, I think that probably there's no other country in the world for which adherence to one grand narrative is as important as it is in Cuba. Um, in Cuba, the um, construction of a grand narrative of a revolution that was totally redemptive, that had absolute support, and that had nothing in common with the past, that didn't reproduce any of the structures of the past, um, that, was, that was created in the first couple of years of the revolution largely by the leadership. And after 1961, really adherence to that narrative, that singular narrative, narrative becomes mandatory. It becomes mandatory because um, no longer is participation at any level of, of the revolution a choice. Um, you have to be a member of a mass organization to retain your job, to retain um, your status as a loyal citizen. Uh, you have to participate in rallies. As a child, you have to be a member of the communist um, pioneers. At every level of your life, every aspect of your life, you have to be connected to this narrative. So <clears throat> to me, I'm very interested in, in exploring how that happened, how you go from a creation of a popular narrative, not necessarily constructed by the people, to a situation in which people are, are effectively policed in their adherence to that narrative. Um, and what does that do to their views and their support and their belief? You know, the Cuban Revolution is extremely important, um, mostly because Cuba is a country um, which shares a lot with Latin America. Cuba was a country that for, um, you know, most of the 20th century and part of the 19th century was deeply shaped by U.S. Um, intervention, U.S. military occupations in the 20th century, U.S. manipulation of internal political process, all for the benefit of U.S. corporations and U.S. business. And when Cuba, in less than three years after this history, manages to consolidate its national sovereignty between 59 and 61. Uh, it becomes the first country in Latin America that says to the United States, the United States is not welcome here, and we're not interested in what you have to say. We're only interested in what we need to do and what we have to say. I really hope people read the book. I think the book is accessible even though it's a big book. And I think that I do a, a, a very um, deliberate job of telling human stories. It's a story, there are many, many people's stories. They're um, not just collective stories, but individual stories that were very powerful to me when I discovered them, encountered them, and, um, and certainly remain that way as I reproduce them in the book.